Linda Hooper, the principal and originator of the, this whole idea. Linda? Yeah, I'll have to say, I don't know if a movie star would not fit me. Uh, opinionated old woman works really well. <laughs> I thank you for having me here. And though we were looking, I kept telling the girls when we got off the interstate, look for a cowboy, look for a cowboy. <laughs> of course, you got the sign out there. If we'd been looking, we could have seen Universal Unitarian Church, but we did not. Um, now, I told Mr. Reddy, you have to kind of tell me when my time is up because I could be a televangelist, y'all. I could talk all day about the wonderful things these kids have done. Yeah, I'll keep, you know, I'll do the best I can not to talk all day. Um, when you said, Mr. Boss, Linda Hooper did it, no, 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 no. Let me, let me just tell you how things go here. In 1998, that's what, 16 years ago, if I'm doing the math right. I and our Student Improvement Council, um, School Improvement Council, we were just looking for a vehicle to help our kids realize three things. Number one, we live in a global community. In 18 hours, even from Whitwell, Tennessee, you could be anywhere on this globe you wanted to be. And whatever I do in Wheatville, Tennessee, or our students do, or you do here in Tullahoma, will affect the entire globe. You know, everything we do, from the foods we choose to eat, to the way we recycle or don't recycle, from the way we treat other people, everything has an impact on the globe. And we need to think about that at all times. The second thing I wanted our children to realize was that no nothing big starts big. Have you ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. Think about the movements that have really made a, a true impact on our, our globe, whether it's negative or positive. Most of those didn't start with this great big huge event. They started with little things. When Hitler and his Nazis began to berate Jews and make them the problem for the world, uh, for all the world's problems, it didn't start with great big things. It started with media, little comic strips, making fun of Jews, blaming them for bad things. It started with making them not be a part of the economy, shutting them out of social things, shutting them out of education, just making fun of people. And I always tell kids, Whatever you do to other people, you're starting a movement. If you're making fun of other students, if you don't want to sit with them at lunch, if you don't want to interact with them just because they don't belong to your social group, then you're no better than a Nazi. None of us are. And the third thing that was really important to me to make kids realize is that within each of us, is that part of the Creator. You know, I do believe that God created and within each of us burns that flame of the Creator. And if you are disrespectful to other human beings, if you are not kind to other human beings, then you are disrespectful and unkind to the Creator. So we were just looking for a vehicle, some way to make our kids aware. <laughs> Now, Whitwell, Tennessee has now 1,720 um, residents. 72% of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunches. And that can go up and down at any time, but it seems to keep going up. Our median education level is 6.6 .6 years. So I always make that a point that people don't think it's degrees, it's years. So, we also live in a really isolated area. We are between the two mountains. It's called the Sequatchie Valley. It's 125 miles long. There are no Jewish families who live there. There are very few people of color. I think in the valley, it, we're probably 99% white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. So, we wanted our kids to realize, you know, that there's a whole different world out there, and we were just looking for a way to make them aware of that. 
We found a group called the I Earn Foundation, and they were having a conference in Chattanooga. Now, the I Earn Foundation is a group that hooks up uh, high school kids to do internet studies, and they do them with schools all across the globe. Now, I never thought that high schoolers were any brighter than my middle schoolers. So I thought, if high schoolers can do this, my middle schoolers can do this. So I sent one of our people, and you know, this is the South, so I sent the football coach. <laughs> <laughs> he was also the assistant principal, but more importantly, he was the football coach. So I sent him to this conference in Chattanooga, and when he came back from that, he said, you know, there's a, there's a study about the Holocaust. And as we sat down with our school improvement council, we thought, what better? Totally foreign culture to a truly evangelical Christian community. Uh, really get the idea of where bullying can lead, because what, what could be <laughs> more in the frame of a bullying society than Nazis? And to see the impact that individual actions could have and to see how people reacted to that. So we decided to do that. We, in that first year, required that an adult from that child's family come with the child to an after-school study for which they got no credit and the teachers got no extra pay. I believe that parents should be first teachers. So if you're going to bring something new to a child, I think the family needs to be involved. So that first year, we had about 40 kids after school and it went really well. One of the students who was in that class was Jehovah's Witnesses family and it was a whole new concept to them to understand that not only did the Nazis murder six million Jewish people, a million and a half of those who were children under the age of 14, but they also murdered five million other people and Jehovah's Witnesses were one of their prime targets simply because in the Jehovah Witness uh, religion, they refused to pledge allegiance to anything other than God. So they were a prime target, along with people with disabilities, along with righteous Gentiles, non-Jewish people who stood up and said, this is wrong. Now, you know, it's really hard, I think, in our society to see wrongs and to stand up. You know, it's so much easier to fuss about it gripe about it, complain about it, but to stand up and say, this is wrong, and knowing what's going to happen to you when you do. So we started this study. It went really well. The next year, the kids wanted to do this again, and the teacher was willing. And sometime in that next year, the students began, now, can you, you know, think about this. 6.2 million people live in the state of Tennessee. 11 million people were murdered by the Nazis. 11 million people for whom the Nazis wrote down their name, the method by which they murdered them, the place where they murdered them, and where they buried those bodies. They wrote those down meticulously. But think about that. Can you grasp that? No, you can't. I can't. Maybe you can, but I can't. I can't even now. And our kids couldn't either. And one of them came to me and said, Ms. Hooper, I cannot get my head around this. Can we collect something that will let us at least see the enormity? I said, you can, but it has to relate to World War II or the Holocaust. Now, kids are smart. These kids have taught me more about my cell phone on the way over here and the <laughs> GPS, and they laugh every time, you know, I've made a mistake. Uh, that I'll ever know. They are smart. They go out, they do this research, and they came back, uh, not a day later, and they handed me a letter. They got the letter, okay? And they told me what they were going to collect. And I said, oh, let me hear what you're going to collect. And they said, we're going to collect paper clips. Now, what would you think? If a group of kids came in and told you, we're going to collect paper clips to represent the souls of six million people, because their original goal was the Jewish people. And I said, 
you're going to collect. What? Paper clips. I mean, think about paper clips. They're everywhere. I was walking in Caesarea in Israel, and there was a rusted paper clip laying at my feet. They're everywhere. People threw them around all over the place. And I said, uh, remember when I told you? It has to be World War II related or Holocaust related. And I said, oh, but it is. Did you know? Anytime a kid asks you, did you know, get ready, because no, you don't know, and they're going to tell you something you never knew. Did you know, Ms. Hooper, that Joseph Baylor is a Jewish gentleman who is Norwegian, who's credited with being the inventor of the paperclip, and Norwegians wore them on their lapels during World War II in protest of Nazi policies. Mm -hmm. And no, I did not know that. And they said, and here's the letter. We're going to send this letter out. And we're going to register with the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And we're going to get six million paper clips. Now, I can be a little cynical, okay? And I'm thinking, they're never going to get six million paper clips, but that's okay. Because they're going to learn some tremendous lessons here. How hard it is to get people to listen to you. Have you ever noticed people don't listen? They're either doing this, or they're thinking about what they're going to have for lunch, or something. It's really hard to get people to listen. So they start sending those letters out, and remember they've registered with the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Lena Geeter happened to be in her 90s, and she was a survivor. Now, I, from the get-go, when I heard from Lena Geeter, I had her image in my head. 90 years old, very opinionated, very assertive lady. She decided that she would be the instrument and we'd get these paper clips. So she calls up Peter and Dagmar Schroeder, who happened to be German journalists working for uh, uh, a newspaper syndicate and station in Washington. And she said, and I can just see her, can't you just see a 90 year old woman? Think me in about 18 years. <laughs> Except she was little, little bitty woman. She said, you, Peter and Dagmar, are going to Whitwell, Tennessee, and you are going to see that a story gets written, and you are going to see that these children get their six million paper clips. They came. She told them to, so they came. They came with that stereotype. You know how people stereotype the South? Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> we don't like African Americans. We don't like anybody else. You know, we're all white. We're all barefoot. We're all pregnant. We're all ignorant. I mean, that's, and especially if you live in the rural South, okay? We're all members of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, that kind of thing. So, Peter and Dagmar came, and their stereotypes got all destroyed. And they go back to Washington. Now, I've decided if you want people in the whole world to know what you're doing, beg somebody at the Washington Post to do a little blurb about you. Because they convinced Dita Smith, who also had the same stereotypes, to come to Whitwell, Tennessee and write about our kids. And she <coughs> did write, destroyed her stereotypes. When Dita Smith's article came out in the Washington Post, we had 150,000 paper clips. And I'm thinking, oh, this is really good. Within six weeks of her article, we had 24 million and counting. <laughs> now, you've not lived till you've counted 24 million paper clips. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They get up and be at school by daybreak, 6 o'clock. They count paper clips till time to have classes at 8 o'clock. And the afternoons, and they'd read these letters and file these letters. In the afternoons, they'd come back and they'd count again after they finished ball practice or whatever, and sometimes we stayed late at night. Now here's what I think is kind of interesting. When we first started getting them, you know how you get those little ACO boxes and it says there's a hundred? They'd open those suckers up and count each one of them, make sure. <laughs> After the first four or five million, they decided they could believe what was in the box. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the wonderful thing were the letters that came with them. Letters from survivors. Letters that told us about people who 
young, young children who were snatched in the middle of the night from their parents and never saw them again. Later on, I had a call from a, um, instead of calling it YMCA, it's called Young Hebrews, YH, whatever, CA, in Long Island, New York. And this lady was a social worker there, and she had a group of survivors. Now, if you've seen the movie, you saw these survivors in the movie. And she wanted to know if they could come down and visit with our school. And of course they could. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience for us. Sam, whom you see in the movie, as he got off the train at Auschwitz, with his brother beside him, little toddler, under the age of three, saw a German soldier snatch his brother, toss him in the air, and bayonet him. You know, we sit here in the United States of America, and we are secure and safe and have more food than we could ever want to eat. One of the camps was called Terezin or Terezin. It's in now what's called the Czech Republic, but was then Czechoslovakia. In Terezin, 15,000 children perished there. Their average calorie allowance was 250 calories a day. And you think about that. That's the equivalent of one Hershey bar. And yet that's all they would have to eat for that day, the next day, that week, that month, that year, as long as they were there or until they starved to death. So many lessons our children have learned about how fortunate they are, and yet how we have to be involved. It breaks my heart, and I tell kids all the time, as soon as you are voting age, you must register to vote. You don't have to like who's running. Pick the best. But you have to be involved. And you need to be a part of what's going on. So we're just going along and, oh, the letters. The letters from liberators. The letters from survivors. The letters from school children. The letters from all sorts of people. The letters from the deniers. We have 126 notebooks now, those three inch, three ring binders with our letters. And we have one notebook that's called the negative letters. Heil Hitler. <clears throat> Linda Hooper is an idiot. And I always wanted to, oh, that's the only one I want to respond to <laughs> because I want to say, honey, I have been a public school educator for 30 plus years. I've been called a whole lot worse things than an idiot. <laughs> my favorite was old white-haired goat. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're just chugging along, and we've got all these paper clips, and they're stuck everywhere, I mean, because we had an old falling in school at that time. And we're going, what are we going to do with these? Somebody suggested, oh, we melt them down and make this sculpture. Uh-uh. These represented souls who had been through crematoriums, who had been through the, the most unimaginable horrors. So what are we going to do with them? Now let me tell you a little secret. Those of you who are in education already know this. Principles. They, they conform to the Peter Principle. You couldn't teach, so they kicked you up to be the administrator. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? And they're, they're not real bright. I could talk about us. So we're sitting there one night. We're having lunch, dinner with all the kids and parents and the Schroders and so on and so forth. And the principal says, you know what we really need? We need an authentic German transport car. And we need to put these paper clips in there so that it shows that you can take a symbol of hate and intolerance and transform, resurrect it into a symbol of life and hope if you use the power of children. Now, 
what did I think we're gonna go out just go to eBay or Craigslist and get a transport car I mean good lord I don't know what, what I had on my brain Jewish people use a Yiddish word for shared it was meant to be I think we never were in charge of this project to begin with you know, you can say Linda Hooper started it, the kids started it, St School Improvement Council, whatever. I, I really don't think we've ever been in charge of the project. So the Schroders said, yeah, that's just what we need. Now, they took five weeks of unpaid leave. They traveled all over. They found in the former Eastern Democratic Republic of Germany, they found a rail car. Among their friends and family, they raised the money to purchase that car. Then they convinced the German, the German Railroad to transport it to the port of Cuxhaven. At that time, the German Navy was bringing over some relics from the war to some museums in the United States. And they convinced the German Navy to transport that car, free of charge again, to the port of Baltimore. It traveled on a Norwegian ship. Does that not give you a little? Yeah. yeah. Called the Blue Sky. Now here's the kicker that I think is the miracle of all miracles. Gets to the port of Baltimore, you know, it's got to get off that ship onto the rail car to bring it to us. The Teamsters Union unloaded it free of charge and put it on that, on CXS. At CSX rails to bring it to Chattanooga where one of our parents worked for a trucking company and they brought it to Whitwell, Tennessee. It was in a pretty bad shape. I mean been sitting outside you know at a, in a private railroad museum all that time. The floor was rotted out we were, our parents had made a platform for it to sit on and there was enough rebar and concrete on that you could have probably put the World Trade Center on it because everybody took ownership. I think if anything on this earth is successful, everybody has to have ownership in it. We wanted to put glass partitions to put the paper clips behind, but we knew we had to do something about the floor. So the guy who came, we did have enough money to put in the partitions. He looked at the floor and he said, I can't put this floor in because, you know, it's too rotty. And I said, well, do the best you can because we don't have any money. Two days later, I had been to a conference and I came in and there was a brand new floor. And I said, uh, how did we do this? He said, Something just told me I needed to put that floor in and not charge it, and he did. So, then we had the Johnson Group. Now you talk about the film. The film was made by the Johnson Group, 180 hours of film. But let me tell you about leading up to their filming they started calling and they wanted to film a documentary and I told the secretaries, I said, no, nah, tell them I'm not here. We don't want to be a part of this. One of my big concerns is that we lose sight of the project and our ego takes over. You know, it's like, you know, we're the star, but you'll see. <laughs> no, uh-uh. I never wanted the kids or the community to lose sight of the fact that 11 million people were murdered because nobody fought back, stood up. The United States didn't, nobody stood up and said this is wrong in a way that made a difference. I did not want us to use the souls of those people to become stars, so to speak. So I just told the secretaries, ignore them. Well, it was snowing one day. And you know the principal goes to school when it snows because the central office is going to tell you five minutes before the kids are supposed to come that no, the buses aren't running that day and then you've got to do all this telephone. And the phone rang. And I picked it up and I answered it and it was the Johnson Group. 
the people who wanted to make the film. And they said, just let us come talk to you. Just let us come. So they did. They came. And they, I found out they were very, very uh, ethical company. They're very involved were they, at, that, at that time with the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatrics Aid Foundation. And they came to make the film. And we had only two, two rules. I made two, well, really three. One, you don't interfere with class. Don't disrupt any classwork. Two, I want as many faces of kids as possible to be shown in this film. Whether or not they ever worked on this project, give them their 15 minutes of fame. And three, if you make these children or this community look like redneck trader or trash, I will rip your heart out and eat it for breakfast. <laughs> Let's just say, if you've seen the movie, I think it turned out right well. We stopped counting paper clips at 30 million. And I want to tell you one story about the clips that are in the car. Uh, one summer, I was sitting in my office, and in the valley, it gets really hot and humid, and there's nobody at school but me, and the doors are open, front doors open, my office doors open, it was hotter. Well, it was hot. <laughs> and you know you have this sense that there's somebody standing there. So I had this sense, like I'm sitting here and the door's over here. And I look up and there was this elderly couple. Now when I say elderly, they were even older than me. They had flown from Los Angeles, California to Nashville, Tennessee and had driven from Nashville, Tennessee to Whitwell. That's about two and a half hours from the airport. And they had one mission for coming there. They had made, you know these little pharmacy envelopes you get? Well, they had made a little envelope like that and in it were four paper clips. And this is what they said. Our parents were murdered by the Nazis. We think. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know where they are. Can we put these four clips in your car so that when we think about our parents, we can know they're surrounded by children who love them? Now, I don't know about you, but I figure all the time, effort, everything that went into this project, that one moment made it worthwhile. That very one moment. We have over 30,000 letters. We never counted the emails. We stopped counting, as I said, at 30 million paper clips. Our children have had the opportunity to learn and sing in Yiddish, along with a group of Jewish children in uh, New York. We have had so many visitors. They come every Friday at 9 o'clock. We entertain groups of people. These two young women do a wonderful job as group leaders. We never lose sight of the fact that everything in life is a choice. And I never, ever go anywhere to speak without sharing this poem with people. And it's called The Gift of Choice. And it's my mantra, and I try every week to read this to myself and think about it. It was written by a wonderful woman called Gertrude Hildreth Hausman. I came into this world without being asked, and when the time comes for dying, I'm not going to be consulted. But between those boundaries of birth and death lies the dominion of choice. To be a doer or a dreamer, a lifter or a leaner, to speak out or to remain silent, to extend my hand in friendship or just look the other way, to be callous and insensitive or to feel the suffering of other people. These are my choices and it is in, a, in my choosing that the measure of my person is determined. And I want to leave you with one story that I think sums that up really well. In March on March the 6th, 1906, two young men were born in the same city in Germany. One, David, was Jewish. 
The other, Adolf, was Lutheran. They became the very best of friends. Now think about your own best friend, you know, and how much they mean to you. They played together. David taught Adolf some Yiddish and some Hebrew, and Adolf taught uh, David some hunting skills and some other things from his culture. They promised they'd be best friends forever. But you know, friendships get interrupted. People move away. Adolf's family moved to Linz, Austria. And they never saw each other again until several years later. And they met again in Auschwitz. And David was a prisoner. And he had on his mattress ticket uniform and he was emaciated and he was filthy and he was hungry and he was a, just a prisoner. Adolf Eichmann was the camp commandant with all that went with it, you know, beautiful uniform, all the power in the world. And he recognized David, and David recognized him. And in Adolf Eichmann's hand was the power to save David's life. But he did not. He made his choice and David perished at Auschwitz. Today, at this moment, is as far in the future as any of us can go. But there's one thing that we need to do our best to create. We need to do all in our power to create a world where love and respect and acceptance become the rule and not the exception. Now, thank you. Thank you.